So, having said all that, um, I want to go to one Bible passage as we start this evening, one of my favorite promises. Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 2. I was talking with a man from Alabama the other day and he said, he said, Pastor, he said, I wish I wasn't alive. When I see what's happening in our world right now and, and what's going to happen soon, he said, I don't want to live. He said, I'm petrified. And I said, do you know why you're petrified? because you have your eyes on yourself. He said, he said you're, you're such a man of courage. I said, no, I'm not. I'm just like you are. Because if I look at the events going on in our world and the forces that are being unleashed on this planet, it's too big for all of us by ourselves. But folks, God didn't call us here to do battle with this by ourselves. So the promise in Isaiah 32 and verse 2 is, and a man, and that man should be capitalized. A man shall be as a hiding place from the wind and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in, the, in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Oh, there's one man who, who fills all of those characteristics and that's the man Christ Jesus and he has told us and made it very clear and we're going to see it real clear tomorrow night with uh, an incredible thing that he is going to do yet just up ahead in the future of this world uh, Jesus has promised us you're not going through earth's final hours by yourself. Don't do it. It'll crush you. It'll eat you alive. Just right on my shoulders. Get connected to me. You know, I love the story of the, the footprints in the sand. You know, the Lord's walking with us through the, the times in our lives. There's two sets of footprints. Then when it comes to those times in my life or somebody else's life where there's only one set of footprints, and that's when we turn and we say, Lord, I thought you said during the toughest times in my life that you'd be with me. Why did you forsake me? And the Lord says, my child, when you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I was carrying so, folk, let's ride. Let's, let's get on Christ's shoulders and let him be a hiding place from the wind, a covert from the tempest, rivers of water in a dry place, the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Because he's promised he will be. He's promised he will be. Well, let's take a look. This evening, ecumenical, uh-oh, <laughs> the children of Israel from the heights of Mount Nebo, they could see over into the promised land. It was time to go home, folk. They could see that land that God had promised to them. Nothing could stop them now. Oh, but something did. Something did. Numbers chapter 25 and verse 1. And we're going to be looking at Numbers 25 this evening. If you'd like to open your Bibles to that chapter. The Bible says Israel abode in Shechem. And the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Now why and how did that happen? Why did the daughters of Moab start coming into the camp of God's people? They had nothing to do with Israel. They were two distinct peoples. 
So why did the daughters of Moab start going into the camp of Israel and leading some of the leading men into physical fornication, whoredom, the Bible says? Well, there was a reason for that because there was a man who used to be a prophet of God. Remember the story about him? The guy who had the donkey speak to him? Nathan, do you remember that story, bud? What was his name? Um, Balaam. Balaam, that's exactly right, bud. That's exactly right. Balaam had been a prophet of God, a spokesperson for the God of heaven. What had, what had made him lose his way? Does anybody know what happened to him? Yeah. What became more important to him? Shrinka, did you say something? Like his desire for Exactly right. He wanted to be a big shot. Wanted money, wanted power, wanted influence. And because of that, Balaam was ready to do anything to gain that wealth and power. And folk, we haven't changed. Same thing is happening today among the professed people of God. As we're going to see as we go through this story tonight. But men wanting position, wanting influence, wanting wealth. Oh, those are scary things. Scary things. So Balak, the king of the Moabites, contacted Balaam in Mesopotamia and he said, Balaam, come and curse God's people. Well, Balaam, you know the story. He, he was told don't go and then he... He dilly-dallied and he fooled around with the, the uh, messengers of Balak. Well, finally he heads off to curse God's people. And that's when he met the donkey. But Balaam was so perverse. And that's what money and the desire for, for power does, folks. We become perverse. We, be, we can't see straight anymore. And that's happening amongst God's professed people today. We can't see clearly. And that's why we're joining up today with the daughters of Moab. We're doing the same thing that ancient Adventism did. Same thing. So Balaam comes and he tries to curse God's people, but he can't do it, can he? He's powerless to curse God's people. So what did Balaam do? He's heading back home. Balak says, get out of my sight. You can't curse them. I have nothing to do with you. So Balak's heading home. He says, ah, oh, that's what we can do. I can't curse God's people as long as they behave like God's people. But if I can make them turn from the God of heaven, then God will do it himself. So Balaam went back and he said, Balak, this is how we're going to destroy God's people. He says, you send the Midianite women into the camp. So, I don't know if you're aware, but, but we've got an, an immoral issue that is plaguing our planet today. Sexual impurity, immorality, it has engulfed this planet. It has engulfed it, friends. Do you think the Balaams of today don't realize, don't, you, you think the devil doesn't realize today if I can get those who claim to be God's people to fall into immorality, sexual impurity, I've got them. They're destroyed. Same thing, folk. So what happens? Balaam's suggestion, Patriarchs and Prophets 454, a grand festival in honor of their gods was appointed by the king of Moab, and it was secretly arranged that Balaam should induce the Israelites to attend. He was regarded by them as a prophet of God, and hence had little difficulty in accomplishing his purpose. Great numbers of the people joined him in witnessing the festivities. Folks, 
it is very dangerous who we regard as a leader among God's people. You, you better be, and I'm going to tell you right now, this is Thursday night. We've got meetings through Sunday morning. If you hear me say something that I can't back up, then you write it down because Sabbath afternoon we're going to have a question and answer time and you politely but firmly challenge me. You understand what I'm saying? I'm up here speaking the words of God. But folk, you listen with intensity. And if I can't back it up, challenge it. Because folk, just because somebody has a name, Balaam had a name. He was a former leader among God's people. Oh, well, Balaam wouldn't say anything wrong. Oh, yes, he would. And God's professed people today, they do the same thing. Come Sabbath morning to Sabbath school and I'll show you. I'll show you real clearly how that's happening among God's professed people. So be very careful when somebody gets up to speak for God, you be very careful as to what you hear. Great numbers of the people joined him in witnessing the festivities. They ventured upon the forbidden ground and were entangled in the snare of Satan, beguiled with music and dancing, allured by the beauty of heathen <coughs> vestals, they cast off their fealty to Jehovah. As they united in mirth and feasting, indulgence in wine, beclouded their senses and broke down the barriers of self-control. Passion had full sway. And having defiled their consciences by lewdness, they were persuaded to bow down to idols. They offered sacrifice upon heathen altars and participated in the most degrading rites. Now, folks, all this was done on a physical level. God's professed people uniting with the daughters of Moab in physical whoredom led to listening to garbage music that beguiled the mind, God's people were then ready to bow down to any God Balaam threw at them. Folk, we got to be very careful where our feet tread. If we're listening to garbage music, you know, I grew up in the time of, of Christian rock. You know, you've heard about Christian rock music, right? You know, folks, there's no such thing as Christian rock music. It's either Christian or it's not. And what makes music Christian? Music that's Christian music, it makes you sit and quietly think about your relationship with God and how much He loves you and how much He wants to be in your life. That's what Christian music does. Rock music, I don't care if it, you know, if it has Christian words, but rock music is the kind that makes you want to you want to move. You want to you want to dance. You want to you know, do this kind of stuff. And what goes on in your head, friends, is garbage. Why? Because that kind of music confuses the mind. And the devil, friends, he was the head of the angel choirs. He knows what kind of music he can use to entrap and grab a human mind. He knows. So... Music that makes us think wrong things, sensual things, angry thoughts, or makes us want to move. It doesn't matter what the words say, friends. Get rid of it. Get rid of it now. Because the devil's using that now to prepare our minds 
for what's ahead of us. He can confuse our minds now and get us ready for what's coming on the earth so that we'll bow down to the daughters, not of Moab, but the daughters of Babylon in Revelation 14 and 17. Balaam tried to curse Israel. He couldn't. He could not curse Israel unless they stopped acting like God's people. So he told the Midianite women to seduce the people of God. It was very successful, but it got him no good. Folk, you know, a couple weeks ago I was out in Arizona and we were talking about what's going on in Seventh-day Adventism today and, and joining up in the ecumenical movement and how Seventh-day Adventist leaders at 3 ABN and amazing facts, and we'll see it very clearly Sabbath morning, how they are deliberately turning from the truth of God. Deliberately doing it. And in the Q&A Sabbath afternoon, a lady stood up and she said, how dare you say those things because the church is going through. Folk, God's true people, they go through. Amen. The truth of God, those who are clinging to Christ and the three angels' messages, boom, they go through. Apostasy in Adventism, ecumenism in Adventism, that's going through, but do you know where it's going to end up? In the lake of fire. That's where it's going, friends. And this idea that all I've got to do is come through a door with a marquee that says Seventh-day Adventist on it, and that's my ticket to the kingdom, friend, that is a bold-faced lie. That's a lie, friends. Apostasy, wickedness, never, never goes through. Never. What happened to Balaam and the Midianites? Well, Numbers 31, 7 and 8 says, They warred against the Midianites as the Lord commanded Moses. They slew all the males. They slew the kings of Midian, beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Ebi, Rechem, Zur, Hur, Reba, five kings of Midian, and Balaam also. Balaam also, the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. You see, friends, you can't, you can't spend your life trying to deceive people, trying to destroy people, and go to heaven? Are you kidding me? Balaam was cut down by God's people because of his apostasy and his wickedness. He was slain by the sword. You know, Revelation 17 and verse 5 tells us about some modern day daughters of Moab, doesn't it? Revelation 17 talks about it. Verse 5 of Revelation 17. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now friends, I have been told for the last 30 years that to talk about this chapter in the Bible is not politically correct. And that we just shouldn't talk about this anymore. And among God's people today, the professed people of God, they won't talk about this anymore, friends, and they won't identify the mother and the harlot daughters. Well, friends, we're going to do that here. And by the grace of God, until my last breath, 
I'm going to continue to identify these powers because these powers are overtaking the world. And God's professed people today are uniting with these forces just like ancient Adventists did on the shores of earthly kingdom. Same way, friends. Who is Babylon the Great, the mother of all abominations? Who is that, friends? The papal, the papal power, that's right. That's right. The papal power. The Roman system had a guy, non-Seventh-day Adventist, spoke with him last Sunday. He said, when you identify the papacy as an evil church, are you talking about the people? I said, let me tell you, we have Roman Catholic nuns and priests and teachers and laymen in the Catholic Church that are embracing the truth of God, especially in the work we're doing in Africa. Folk, they see the truth and they grab it. They grab it because they see it's true and it gives them purpose in life and direction. I said, no, we're not talking about individual Roman Catholics. There are some lovely Roman Catholics who are living up to all the light they have. We're talking about a system, a system that is wicked and evil and seeking to destroy the truth of God from the earth. He said, well, how about Pope Francis? He seems to be a good guy. I said, well, I think you need to go back and study the dirty war in Argentina from 1975 to 1983 when hundreds of thousands of Argentinians disappeared and were never seen again by their families. In the dead of night, they were sleeping, and all of a sudden, they're gone. And Pope Francis was the leading cleric the leading churchman in Argentina at that time. And the church is supreme in Argentina. And who are the harlot daughters of Babylon the Great? Who are those harlots, friends? Who are they? Apostate churches. Apostate Protestant churches. That's right. Scott, right? Yes. Yeah, good. That's Keith. Okay. <laughs> Apostate Protestant churches. And folks, why is it? And I asked this question a few years back. I was out in Whitmore, California, and I, I looked at the folks and I said, well, who are these powers? I'm sure your pastor in the Adventist churches, they talk about this all the time, don't they? You know, folks, I got, I got this, this glassy-eyed look and I said, yeah, you're right. You don't hear that anymore, do you? And they said, I said, why is that? That's when the pin, you couldn't hear a pin drop. And I said, the reason why is because in the Adventist church today, predominantly, they have united with Babylon the Great. And they have united with the apostate Protestant churches. So they don't speak ill about them anymore. That's why, friends, nominal Adventism today has united with these powers in ecumenical fornication, just as ancient Adventism did on the shores of earthly kings. Same thing, friends. Same thing. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 458. God requires of his people now as great a distinction from the world in custom, habit, and principle as he required of Israel anciently. If they faithfully follow the teachings of his word, this distinction will exist. It cannot be otherwise. 
The warnings given to the Hebrews against assimilating with the heathen were not more direct or explicit than are those forbidding Christians to conform to the spirit and customs of the ungodly. Christ speaks to us, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The followers of Christ are to separate themselves from sinners, choosing their society only when there is opportunity to do them good. We cannot be too decided in shunning the company of those who exert an influence to draw us away from God. You say, but, but those people in the Catholic churches and, and the people in those apostate Protestant churches, they're Christians just like I am. They better not be. <laughs> they worship on Sunday. Do you worship on Sunday? Do you believe that when you die, you can communicate with people that are dead? Do you, do you believe that? Do you believe that, that hell burns for eternity? That God is some wrathful, vengeful being? No. We should be very distinct and very different. You say, but you have no proof that Seventh-day Adventists today are involved in ecumenism with Roman Catholic and apostate Protestant churches. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. Appreciate that. Here's a statement. The Spanish Union of Churches Conference is the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Spain. Its official news magazine is called Revista Adventista España. Esther Azone, co-editor of the magazine, recently wrote a short article and provided a link to a 102-page report revealing that Seventh-day Adventist institutions within her union have been participating in government-sponsored ecumenical climate change initiatives. These initiatives are promoting and implementing the policies of Pope Francis contained in his encyclical, Laudato Si. The name of the government-sponsored climate change initiative is called the Inner Religious Guide to Good Practices in Climate Culture. It promotes ecumenism, environmentalism, spiritualism, pantheism, Eucharistic celebrations, and even calls for a Sabbath for the planet. <laughs> the Seventh-day Adventist Union Conference in Spain has made this pro Laudato Si guide on climate change available to all Seventh-day Adventists throughout its official news website. Friends, you know what the core to Pope Francis' ideas on climate change, you know what the core thing is with that? called S-U-N-D-A-Y. Did you know that? Right there, friends. I've got a, a talk on that. In Francis' mind, when he says climate change, what he means is we are going to make climate change such a big issue that the only way that we're going to repair it is by setting aside one day of the week. Sunday. That's what Francis means. And how is it that the Seventh-day Adventist churches throughout Spain are promoting and implementing the policies of Pope Francis contained in Laudato Si and are joining in and promoting ecumenism? Friends, were we called to unite with the other churches? We were called, friends, to say Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's what we were called to say. We were called to say 
Come out of her, my people. Because, friend, those churches are going to be destroyed. Revelation 18 says that, friends. And if Seventh-day Adventists unite with these apostate and Roman Catholic churches as they are in Spain, the same plagues that fall on apostate Protestants and Roman Catholics will fall on apostate Adventism. Here's another one. Wednesday, April 28, 2021. What, four months ago? Several churches attended an interfaith conference on the theme of Eucharistic hospitality. Enrico Benedetto, pastor and theologian representing the Waldensian Church. Hans Gutierrez, pastor and theological professor at the Seventh-day Adventist Seminary in Italy. A physician and a frequent contributor to Spectrum Magazine represented the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Giovanni La Rosa, a priest from Randazzo, Sicily, represented the Anglican Church. Carmine Napolitano, president of the Federation of Pentecostal Churches, represented the Pentecostal Church. And Silvano Nicoletto, a priest who runs a monastery, in Cisano, Italy, represented the Roman Catholic Church. According to Rome's ecumenical movement, we are all invited. We're all one. Are we, friend? Are we one with Rome? The Seventh-day Adventists here in Italy, they're saying we are. But we're not. We better not be. Because if we are, we're going to end up bowing down to the gods of Moab, and it's going to be ugly. It's going to be very, very ugly. We're all one. We're all part of Christ. And for this reason, they conclude that participation in the same Eucharistic bread and wine must be followed. A failure to do so is a betrayal of Jesus. You, do you hear what that's going to, friends? Do you hear what that is saying right there? The ultimate unifying factor in the mind of Rome is for all people across the earth. We're one to all take the body, the literal body of Christ that the priest created into the, in the bread and for us to partake of that emblem from a Catholic priest. Are you ready to do that, friends? Mm -hmm. That's where this is heading, friends, with all the churches. And anybody who doesn't go along with that, what did they say it is? You're betraying Jesus. And who was Christ's betrayer? What was his name? Jesus. Judas. And what will happen to the Judases of this world who won't take the Eucharistic bread, friends? What will happen to them? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Ostracized, kicked out of society, the excrement of the earth, and hunted down. That's where this is heading, friends. And Seventh-day Adventists are a part of that? And nobody says a word about it. About 15 years ago, I would have been back in 2006, we mass mailed the book, The Enemy Unmasked to Silverton, Oregon. Now the Enemy Unmasked talks about the fact that there is Roman Catholic and apostate Protestant churches uniting together to promote sun worship throughout the world. Okay? That's part of it, what's in that book. Well, 
We mass mailed it to every residence in this town. The local Adventist pastor wrote a letter to the local newspaper, and this is what he said. Now listen carefully. He says, the enemy unmasked is inflammatory. It's inflammatory. And damaging to the efforts of Christian brotherhood and goodwill. What's he talking about? Oh, he'll explain himself. You watch. I enjoy very much my fellowship with all Christian pastors and believers in my community. Who are those Christian pastors he's talking about? Come on now, who's he talking about, friends? Apostate Protestants. She, no, that's Sheila. Uh, Diane. Diana. Diana. Forgot the A, I'm sorry. Apostate Protestants. That's who he's talking about. Fifteen years ago, friends, the Adventist denomination was saying, this guy was saying, I'm in, I'm in bed with these apostate Protestant pastors. They, they're my buddies. And they're Christians. They're Christians. But whoever the guy was who wrote the enemy at mass, he is harming the cause of Christ. So who harms the cause of Christ in this world, friend? Who's been harming the cause of Christ for the last 6,000 years? Who is it? The devil. That's right. So whoever wrote the enemy unmasked, who's he following? He's following the devil. Friend, in this Adventist pastor's mind, if you present the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 and the message of Revelation 17 and 18, do you know what you are? You're of the devil. <coughs> And nobody can speak against my fellow Christian pastors because we are unified together. You see what's going on, friends? Seventh-day Adventism has been bamboozled into believing that all these other churches are fellow Christian believers. That's not what the Bible says, is it, friends? <clears throat> Who's he referring to? He's referring to the pastors of Sunday-keeping churches in his area. He wants to have and does have good relations with them. He calls them fellow Christians. To the contrary, the book Enemy Unmasked is harmfully said to the cause of Christ. So the book is of the devil and should not be read. Wow. And who is the Seventh-day Adventist ringleader? There's a few ringleaders in Seventh-day Adventism today that are joining up with the daughters of Moab, friends. This is the Adventist leader right here who is the head of the ecumenical drive in Seventh-day Adventism. But to only say it's him, no friend, Jan Paulson from, what was it, 2001 to 2010, he was involved in the ecumenical movement. That was his expertise when he got his doctorate at an ecumenical university in Germany called Tübingen University. And then, to honor Luther's 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, the president of the General Conference, Ted Wilson, went to Moscow and met with all the leaders of all different churches, friend, in ecumenical unity. This man's name is Gwenun Diop, and here he is meeting with Pope Francis. I'm, but I'm sure. I am sure, friend. 
that as Diop spoke with Pope Francis, he said, Pope Francis, before you and I can be brothers, you need to give your life to Christ and begin keeping the Sabbath. I'm sure he said that, didn't he, friends? Yeah, that's right. It was a big joke. That's exactly right. So Numbers 25, verse 6, what's it say? Behold, one of the children of Israel. Now these are Seventh-day Adventists. One of the Adventists came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses. You'd think that the man would have shame. You'd think if he was doing something so bold and so immoral and so wicked as this, that he'd go hide in a tent somewhere or in a cave. But no. This Seventh-day Adventist leader brought this apostate, impure woman right into the church, right into the very midst of Adventism. And that's what Gwenoon Diop and Ted Wilson are doing today, friends. They're bringing the ecumenical movement right into Seventh-day Adventism. So what happened? In the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, Here's Benun Diop with Pope Francis and a host of leaders from all different churches in an ecumenical gathering. Why? Because they're brothers and sisters in Christ. Is that our mission, friends? Is that what God called us to do? This is what God called us to do. Revelation 18, 4-8. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her. Come out of her, my people. That ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. So while Seventh-day Adventists, in their utter blindness, are saying, these are fine Christian people. The Bible says that Babylon has become the cage of every foul and hateful bird. That doesn't describe Christians, friend. What has happened to our discernment? The sins of these churches have reached to heaven. God will remember their iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you. And double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she has filled, fill to her double how much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. She shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Friends, uniting with these churches is going to bring the plagues of heaven. And if Seventh-day Adventism, in their unifying with these groups, they will suffer the same plagues as these churches will. So what does Benun Diop say in his defense? Well, listen to this. He says, interchurch and interfaith relations do not mean ecumenism in the sense of union with other churches, doctrinal alliances, obliteration of differences, or the loss of distinctive emphasis on biblical truth. Really? Well, you tell me, friends, why it is that we don't hear the second and third angel's message in Seventh-day Adventism anymore. Why don't you hear it, friends? Because 
our distinctive emphasis on the second and third angel's message has been obliterated by the ecumenical movement. Diop goes on and says, a misunderstanding of this fact has promoted a few at the fringes of the church to accuse Adventist leaders of betraying the church's position, which they assume demands there be no interaction with other Christians at all. Excuse me? That's exactly what Seventh-day Adventists have done, friend. It's exactly what they've done. They have betrayed the church's position. This radical rejection of mingling with others is at times expressed through violent and angry rhetoric. Friends, is our job to unite with other churches in ecumenical Eucharistic gatherings? Is that what we've been called to do? No, friend, we've been called to preach to them. Come out of her, my people. Come out of her. Those churches are going to be destroyed. We love the people in other churches enough to tell them the truth. And then Diop defends, he says, in the Bible and the writings of Ellen White, we have a clear picture that antagonism and hostility toward other Christians is preaching the three angels' messages? Is that hostility? What's he talking about? Antagonism? Is that being antagonistic to preach the truth of God? Come on, Gwenoon. So a Seventh-day Adventist leader brings apostasy into the church. And Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it. He rose up from among the congregation, took a javelin in his hand. He went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. Friends, there will be there will be a consequence for Seventh-day Adventists uniting in ecumenical unity in Italy, in Spain, in America, in Mexico, in Germany, all over the world, friend. There will be a repercussion. Just as there was on the shores of earthly Canaan. 24,000 Seventh-day Adventists perished. And they could look over from Mount Nebo and see the Promised Land. Well, folk, we can see the Promised Land. It's just before us today. But before we get there, there will be a plague among Seventh-day Adventists because of this ecumenical movement and thousands, thousands of Seventh-day Adventists who have united in apostate ecumenical interactions with the daughters of Babylon, they will suffer the terrible consequences. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're grateful tonight for your word. We are grateful tonight for your sure word of prophecy that shines as a light in a dark place. We are grateful tonight for the clarity of the messages of Revelation 14, 17, and 18 that clearly identify your people and the apostate churches. We pray for the Holy Spirit to empower us to call those who are still in those churches, to 
call them out of those communions and into the truth of heaven. Strengthen and help us to fulfill that divine mission. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen.